Hello! In the following, I would like to talk about the concept and the procedural aspects of unity of invention under the PCT. I would first like to discuss what unity invention is all about and then I would like to touch upon some of the procedural aspects before the International Searching Authority and then before the International Preliminary Examining Authority. So what is unity of invention? Well, simply put, it's a question of money. Authorities would not like to do additional work if they do not receive also additional fees. So the idea is that for each and every invention that an applicant is making and filing as a patent application, he is required to pay a set of fees. If he packages more than one invention into an application, it's more work for the authority, so they should also obtain more fees for the work that they have to perform. And the idea really is very similar also both under the PCT and under national law. Under national law, if there's more than one invention, usually national law requires applicants to divide up their applications and to file separate divisional applications. And for each of those divisional applications, they will have to pay a set of fees. And so the office gets compensated for the additional work that they have with those particular applications. Now under the PCT it works a little differently because we do not have the concept under the PCT of filing divisional applications. A PCT application always stays together as a whole and so the only thing that offices under the PCT, authorities under the PCT can ask for is the payment of either additional search fees if there's lack of unity of invention before the ISA or additional examination fee if the IPA, the International Preliminary Examining Authority, discovers that there's lack of unity if a Chapter 2 demand has been filed. Now clearly, in order to come up with a decision that there's lack of unity, you need to have a clear definition of what unity of invention is all about. And this definition is contained in PCT Rule 13. There it says that an international application should only contain one invention. If, if there's multiple inventions in one application, they must be so linked to form a single general inventive concept. And this general inventive concept only exists if there's a technical relationship involving one or more of the same corresponding special technical features. And so what are these special technical features? Uh, special technical features means technical features that define a contribution which each of the inventions considered as a whole make over the prior art. So that's the definition contained in Rule 13. It's relatively difficult to understand like that. So I will try to give you a little bit of an example of what lack of unity of invention really means. So take a look here at this golf ball. It's a little bit funny that I use a golf ball as an example because I'm not really a golf player. But I was told that some of the particular technical features about a golf ball are, have a lot to do with the little dimples that you see on a golf ball and the way the, the dimples are organized, the pattern of those dimples on a golf ball. So if someone comes up with a new pattern of those dimples, there could potentially be up to three inventions that an applicant could put into an international application and they could still be considered as forming unity of invention, so a single inventive concept. Now, what are, for instance, those three inventions that one could think of? Well, first of all, it's the golf ball as such, as such and the way the golf ball travels because of those dimples through the air once it has been uh, hit uh, by the player. The second invention is the manufacturing process of such a golf ball with those particular dimples in it. And the third one could, for instance, be the machines and the tools that you use to produce such a golf ball. And if you package all of those inventions into one single application, you still might get away with having unity of invention in this particular application and you will not be invited to pay additional search fees by the ISA or by the IPA. Now this is just a small little example and of course we have a lot more of such examples. 
which you can find in the International Search and Preliminary Examination Guidelines which are available on our website and there we have paragraphs which cite a lot of examples where the international searching authorities and international preliminary examining authorities have agreed yes in this case there is unity of invention and yes in this case or rather no in this case there is no unity of invention so there is lack of unity invention so take a look at those examples and they might help in guiding you in a particular case if you get a decision from the ISA or the IPA whether you can challenge possibly that decision later on by finding a good example in these guidelines which could then convince the ISA that they maybe should reconsider their decision. So let's take a look at these procedural aspects of unity of invention and I will start off with the procedure before the international searching authority. So if the search copy reaches the International Searching Authority, they will, as one of the first things that they have to perform, check whether there is or is not unity of invention in that particular application. So whether there is more than one invention in a particular application. And if there are multiple inventions and there's lack of unity, they will only search the other inventions if additional search fees have been paid. So they will bring this to the attention of the applicant, they will explain in detail why they think there's lack of unity of invention and at the same time they will invite the applicant to pay additional search fees. Now it's important to realize that the PCT application will stay together as a whole even if there is lack of unity. So no part of the application will be considered withdrawn at this stage. It stays together but of course if you do not pay additional search fees then only the main claimed invention will be searched not the other inventions which are also contained in this international application. Keep also in mind that if you choose not to pay additional search fees and you later on file a demand claims relating to inventions which haven't been searched will also not be examined by the IPA. And of course also, if there is lack of unity of invention, keep in mind that when you later on enter the national phase with your international application, the national offices will come up with similar issues and most likely will ask you at this point to now file divisionals, to divide up your application or to drop part of your application if they also agree that there is lack of unity of invention in your particular application. If you get the invitation from the ISA, you essentially have three choices. You can either pay the additional search fees or at least pay some of the additional search fees. You choose not to pay any additional search fees and as I said then only the main claimed invention will be searched. Or you pay the additional search fees and you pay them under protest. Now many authorities, if you file a protest, charge you a protest fee. There are some that don't charge a protest fee but many ISAs and also IPAs would charge a protest fee. Keep in mind the fourth option that you might have already thought of does not exist. You cannot simply protest without paying additional fees. So the protest procedure is only available to applicants who have chosen to file the additional search fees. So what is the best option? It really depends. Sometimes there are cases where the examiner at the ISA comes to a conclusion there's not just one invention in this application but there may be hundred inventions in a particular application. That could be in a chemical case uh, and there it would be extremely expensive to pay all those additional search fees. On the other hand, if you realize, all right, I accept there are maybe two inventions in my particular application, I really need all of it to be searched because I'm not so certain about the relevant prior art which is out there, well maybe in such a case it's worth paying an additional search fee to get your entire application searched by the International Searching Authority. Whether it makes sense to protest, well that depends also whether you really have a good case and you have maybe good examples that you could draw out from the International Search and Preliminary Examination Guidelines and you could use them as arguments with the ISA or the IPA to convince them that maybe they should reconsider their initial decision and agree with you that there is really unity of invention in your particular case. If you do file a protest, additional searches of course will be, pay, uh, will be 
uh, made because you paid additional search fees. And then there will be this parallel procedure where a panel of examiners will review the initial decision taken by the examiner on unity of invention. And if you fully succeed, if they overrule the initial decision and they come to the conclusion that there has in fact been unity of invention, you will get a refund of the additional search fees that you have paid and also a refund of the protest fee if that particular searching authority has charged such a protest fee. However, if you're only partially successful, then only some of the additional search fees will be refunded to you. And in this case, if you had to pay a protest fee, that protest fee would not be refunded uh, to you. So let's take a look now at the procedural aspects before the IPA. And in fact, the procedure before the IPA is essentially the same as before the International Searching Authority. They apply the same definition of unity of invention of Rule 13 of the PCT. And again, uh, you will get an invitation from the IPA if the examiner at the IPA finds that there's lack of unity of invention. Keep in mind also that in many instances, it's the same authority that will do the search and the preliminary examination. And often it's even the same examiner. So most likely he or she will come up with exactly the same decision on lack of unity of invention. And again, here you would have the three choices. You either pay the additional examination fee, you don't pay, or you pay under protest. Now what's a little bit special about the procedure before the IPA is that here you can really choose which part and which inventions in your international application you would like the examiner at the IPA to examine. Remember, before the ISA, you will always get a search done on the main claimed invention. And there you don't really have a choice in the matter. But before the IPA, you can say, well, here is my demand. I want my second invention to be examined. And I pay maybe an additional set of examination fees. And I also want my third invention now to be examined. So not necessarily the first or main claimed invention. But do keep in mind one important limitation, of course. If you did not pay additional search fees before the ISA or, or not all additional search fees, don't select a part before the IPA, an invention which has not been searched by the ISA. Because in that case, the IPA can turn around and say, well, this invention hasn't been searched, so we will not conduct an international preliminary examination on this particular part, on this particular invention either. If you choose to pay additional examination fees, also before the IPA, you can pay them under protest and there will be a very similar procedure, a protest procedure, uh, a parallel procedure, just like before the ISA. So I hope this short presentation gave you a little bit of a better understanding of the concept of unity of invention under the PCT. I talked about the procedural aspects before the ISA and the IPA and the various choices that you might need to make at the time when you receive an invitation from the ISA or the IPA that there is lack of unity of invention. Do keep in mind that these decisions of lack of unity of invention are possibly not easy to challenge before the ISA and the IPA. And our recommendation really is that you only do so if you have a very good case, backed up maybe by the examples that I talked about before from the International Search and Preliminary Examination Guidelines. And if you have a convincing case, do try to fight it with the ISA or the IPA, and then maybe you will be successful with your protest procedure.